Merci. Hello, and welcome to Beyond the Game. I'm Zachary Draves. We are just about through the first full month of 2021. And even though we were looking for a fresh new start after the turmoil and tragedy of 2020, sadly, little has changed on that front. We were hit with one of the worst domestic terrorist attacks in recent memory. The Capitol insurrection on January 6th was a white supremacist assault on democracy and those images will be seared into our collective memory. As those thugs unleash their wrath, and in the immediate aftermath, many correctly pointed out the clear racial double standard as Black Lives Matter protesters were met with pepper spray, mace, and bullets. The insurrectionists were met with sympathy from certain politicians and commentators, as well as opportunities to take selfies with police. These insurrectionists were the same people who claimed that Colin Kaepernick and other athletic figures engaging in peaceful protests of injustice were the ones who were disrespecting America, the flag, the anthem, and the military. Yet they stormed the Capitol with American flags, Confederate flags, and a noose. And they say they hold the mantle of what it means to be a patriot? Give me a break. The future of this country remains uncertain. Even as the prospects of a new administration give some hope, there are still forces of white supremacist and nativist terror lurking throughout, with certain figures in government and media looking to rationalize their actions. This discussion will be ongoing and will ultimately find a place in the world of sports. As athletes made huge strides in pushing our society to live up to its ideals of justice and equality this past year, the question becomes, where do we go from here? Will athletes continue to speak up? Will they just go back to sticking to sports? Can there be a balance between athletic excellence and social responsibility? To help us answer those questions, we are excited to be joined this evening by two amazing guests. Mushami Robinson, 2004 Olympic track and field gold medalist with a decade of success in international competition, as well as an 11 time All American in track and field at the University of Texas at Austin, who is currently preparing to return to track and field to compete for a spot in the Tokyo Olympics this summer. And we're also joined by Dr. Amiria Rose Davis, Assistant Professor of History and African American Studies at Penn State University, where she specializes in 20th century American history with an emphasis on race, gender, sports, and politics. She is also the author of the forthcoming book, Can't Eat a Medal, The Lives and Labors of Black Women Athletes in the Age of Jim Crow, as well as the co-host of the feminist sports podcast, Burn It All Down. We are pleased to welcome Mushami Robinson and Dr. Maria Rose Davis. Thank you both for joining us and welcome to Beyond the Game. Thank you for having me. It's awesome to be here, Zach. Yeah. Oh, it's awesome to have both. It, it's awesome to have both of you here. So we have a lot to get into in just a short amount of time. So we'll get right into it. Um, just starting with really just the aftermath of the Capitol insurrection, because it's been two to two and a half weeks since it happened, and we're still trying to make sense of it all. Um, Mashami, I'll start off with you. What was your reaction to those events? You know, to be a school teacher, to be honest with you, Zach, um, I had just ended class um, teaching third graders online, 16 third graders, and to log off and then turn on my television, I was heartbroken. Um, I was devastated. I was in shock um, because I love this country so much. And the one thing I know is that 
what I pride myself in representing this country, even in the Olympic Games, is that we're a country of so many different cultures and so many different opportunities um, for us to see perspective. And, you know, I just know that we know how to do that better. We know how to disagree better. We know how to come to a space better than what I saw. And as a, an educator, you know, I just had to think about what is my narrative going to be the next day? Indeed. I mean, both questions, you know, trying to wrestle with all of those questions and your role as an educator, as you pointed out, comes with a huge weight and a huge responsibility. And Dr. Davis, really the same question to what happened. Yeah, I mean, it's such a heartbreaking day for me because we come off of a morning where the Senate races in Georgia had largely been decided by rural Black voters, Black voters in Atlanta, Black voters across the state fighting voter suppression tactics and flipping the state and then flipping, you know, those Senate seats. And it was just a kind of stirring, heartbreaking reminder of how fragile our citizenship is, particularly for Black citizens who had to watch protesters get their hands held and escorted out of the building after participating in the insurrection, where we could see the amount of force responded, to, responding to an insurrection versus responding, as you said, Zachary, at the beginning of the show, to Black Lives Matter protesters was just like a continued smack in the face, a reminder, like, my citizenship is not your citizenship. And, you know, I would echo everything, you know, that was said about the difficulty in terms of being an educator. You know, I was a week out from teaching classes on American history, on America in the 60s, and, and trying to make sense of and contextualize a moment that too many people seem to also want to rush past. You said it was just two weeks ago. There were so many people already trying to put it in a rear view as if there wasn't a major insurrection that happened. And so I think grappling with those things have left me profoundly, profoundly heartbroken. Indeed, and to that point, really, um, I mean, we can all just know what would be what would have been said if it had been Black Lives Matter that stormed the Capitol. Of just the commentary coming from certain politicians and certain commentators utilizing their bully pulpit to, you know, trash Black Lives Matter, and they've been trashing Black Lives Matter throughout um, since Black Lives Matter really came to fruition a, a several years ago. And one of the faces that stood out in the crowd of the insurrectionists ultimately ended up being an Olympian, uh, Cleet Keller, who was an Olympic swimmer who competed in 2000, 2004, 2008. He even anchored uh, Michael Phelps uh, in those games. And he was present and he was wearing uh, U.S. Olympic attire uh, during the insurrection. And, you know, a lot of information has come out about him, you know, in terms of the fact that he has struggled with mental illness and, you know, he has gone through divorce and has gone through homelessness. And certainly we sympathize with him when it comes to that, but that doesn't negate the need for accountability for the fact that he was there. And also it made me think a lot about, you know, just the commentary surrounding him, that because he's had these vulnerabilities and has had these hardships in his post-Olympic life, that, you know, we need to understand where he was coming from and understand, you know, contextualizing his, his whole life. Whereas if it had been or when it was an athlete, particularly a black athlete who was at a Black Lives Matter protest a year ago, you often hear this trope of where are they when black on black crime happens? Where are they you know, promoting black fatherhood and, you know, this notion of respectability politics and things like that. Um, and Dr. Davis, I'll throw this to you, you know, just sort of talk about how this notion of respectability politics reinforces uh, this racial double standard in sports and in the rest of society. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that you hit on it in terms of empathy and who gets extended empathy and who doesn't. Um, I think that, you know, these, these, suspicions around black athletes their motivations even though you know black athletes speak out they write op-eds they host town hall meetings they answer media questions and yet people act like their motivations are so confounding and they they try to pathologize rather than empathize and i think that's the difference in what you see here with you know with keller it was this profound like rush to empathize 
Um, and you know, that never gets pathologized. Like his actions will never be widespread indication of like what white boy Olympians, you know, do or have, you know, whatever. And I think that, you know, the, that when I talk about heartbreaking things, like it's that double standard. I think about the 16 year old girl who stole Speaker Pelosi's laptop, which has got to be multiple federal crimes, right? Um, and there's a meme going around juxtaposing her with 16 year old Khalif Browder, who was alleged to have stolen a backpack. And while this young woman who participated in an insurrection and stole federal property from one of the most powerful women, in the country was just released to her her parents under the guise of she's 16 we need to empathize like how did this happen khalif browder was you know sentenced to prison was there held without hearing for three years before he ultimately you know took his life and it's that double standard that i think at the root of it is this effort to turn away from empathy and and dehumanize folks that that are black who are brown who are indigenous who seem like they're the other. Um, and I think that, that that we see that playing into a double standard throughout sports, throughout society in general. Indeed. And really, you know, nobody is going to question, you know, where was his father? What type of music is he listening to? No one's going to associate that with, with Keller um, as he eventually goes to federal prison. I mean, he's hit with federal charges already. Um, but Mashami, I'll throw it to you as far as like, you know, the whole idea of the Olympic movement and what the Olympic uh, ideals are supposed to be about. Um, because not only, I should also point out, not only have you competed in the Olympics, you're also involved in the Social Justice and Racial Justice Council put together by the uh, United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee um, that was formed over this past year. Um, so talk a little bit about um, you know, what does it mean to be an Olympian and holding up those Olympic ideals? You know, it's an interesting thing because when you ask me, you know, what does it mean to be an Olympian? Um, just with what we were talking about with the double standard, I have to be candid when I tell you that my Black African American experience is different from the Olympic gold medalist who, um, as we said, uh, has the other position and you know my experience as an olympian i mean to be on team usa to represent the united states of america and then to win um that is something that i think we are some of the most patriotic individuals in terms of what this country um, stands for and what we know we can be when we see indifference, you know, I think as athletes, um, one of the things that we know is that sports unites. So a lot of us find some of the most diverse spaces in sports and we have to learn to adjust the way we see our perspective and we have to learn to really dive into other individuals and have some introspection about the way we view others. Not so much when we have society and just that's not an everyday practice. And so when you see an Olympian, um, I can tell you one thing that I have encountered um, with the, the mental things that we talk about that really are happening for black Americans um, being an Olympic gold medalist, you wouldn't imagine how much microaggression I experience, how much um, underlying, you know, maybe on the outside, right? I have the appearance and I'll be put on the flyer or the local politician um, will use me to help win the election, but I won't get the job, right? I won't get the, the executive position or I won't have the opportunity here. Interesting, I found this very interesting. When people meet me, particularly white males, and I share my medal and they know they meet me because I'm an Olympic gold medalist, oftentimes what I've heard them say is that you should wear that around your neck. If I had an Olympic gold medal, I'd wear it around my neck. And over the years, I finally heard it different. And I'm thinking, oh, they're saying that that would qualify me. It's like, you know, wear that Olympic gold medal around your neck so we know that you're a different one as opposed to just respecting me as a human being with perspective or just appreciating that any Olympian, Paralympian that has reached such a position in their sport has worked really hard. And that's a human thing in terms of discipline and self-love and self-care. And so I've always thought that was profound as an Olympic gold medalist and being a black female in face. And the way you touched upon that um, and sharing, and thank you for sharing that, um, you know, the idea that because you have an Olympic gold medal that, you know, 
certain, you know, white Americans in particular will look at you differently and see above race, you know, be race neutral, be colorblind, quote unquote. Um, but just kind of looking at history, you know, we can we all know the story of Muhammad Ali, for example, when he won his gold medal at the 1960 Olympics in Rome, he comes back home to Louisville and he's met with systemic racism. You know, he can't access, you know, um, lunch counters, he can't access restrooms, et cetera, and other public facilities. And yet, you know, the story, as we've all been told, is that he took uh, his gold medal and threw it into the river um, because that Olympic gold medal, you know, meant nothing and ultimately because your humanity is ultimately being uh, frowned upon and degraded uh, by society. And so, um, you know, there's an interesting conversation to really be had about that. And since we're on the theme of the Olympics, um, Mushami, you were instrumental in the historic decision, really, to um, uh, rescind the rule that was put in place by the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee that punished protesters uh, or athletes who engaged in protests during competition. Um, and so talk a little bit about how that decision uh, was reached. Mm. Well, you know, I was really proud to see, um, one, the USOPC take a serious position. Um, and I have to, you know, um, give honor and just some props to our CEO, Sarah Hirschland, who's come into an entity that has needed a lot of change from an organic level to really serve all of our athletes um, the best way we can. And so for them to launch um, an athlete-led council and really want to dive into our issues and take up um, Rule 50, because that was a very resounding issue within USA Track and Field amongst many other sports. And having been um, sitting as one of the six members of the leadership committee for the Athlete Advisory Council within the USOPC, I always felt that Rule 50 isolated the U.S. athlete, particularly the Black U.S. athlete, when they chose to speak on not being able to kneel or raise your fist. And my position had never changed um, because I felt like out of the 206 countries that compete in the nations, to choose one nation, um, one nation that really is a strong brand to the entire Olympic movement. Um, and, you know, being Team USA, I just felt as an American and as you, a USA uh, athlete, to isolate us and to point out something that, you know, we know that one, the bulk of the black US athletes do bring in a lot of the funding, a lot of the money in terms of the medals that are won, in terms of a lot of the sponsorships. And so when we talk about those athletes in a subliminal way and speak on those athletes not being able to silently demonstrate because I've asked them to, you know, not use the protest word, they were willing to listen to conversation. So when you are seen and heard, or you allow someone to speak to you, you can gain different perspective and understand where you may have misstepped or understand where you need to shift in your thought, particularly when you know it's for the greater good because athletes silently bringing awareness to police brutality is exactly what you were saying. Um, you know, I, I'm on town halls and I'm in Zoom meetings and two or three hours later, you know, police officers show up my, at my home uncalled. And so it was these real conversations that we were having in the midst of that people could no longer say it wasn't happening when you just got off the phone with me and I'm frantic and everyone's trying to figure out what's going on. So, you know, that's what really allowed us to be able to move the needle on where are we going and let's lead the conversation and be innovators in the space of change and inclusion. And we should also point out that Rule 50, which is imposed by the International Olympic Committee that prohibits protests from ever existing uh, within the games. And Dr. Davis, uh, Dave Zirin, who is uh, the famed writer of the uh, Nation Magazine, famed sports writer of the Nation Magazine, uh, he did an, he wrote an excellent article uh, recently talking about Cleet Keller, but putting it into the context of the Olympic movement historically, because uh, just you know, obviously looking through history, the Olympic Games promotes this idea of peace and equality through sportsmanship, but yet they, co they coddle with and work in favor towards those oppress oppressive regimes um, that host the Olympics. I mean, obviously we can think about 1936 in Berlin when uh, um, Ralph, or I'm sorry, I'm sorry, uh, Avery Brundage, the infamous uh, head of the IOC, worked closely with Hitler that eventually led to Hitler having the Olympics in 1936. Talk a little bit about sort of that 
contradiction of, you know, they say they're for peace and unity and, and sportsmanship, but yet they have this dirty dark side as well. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> the Olympics in the history of the Olympic movement has always been one that, um, you know, tries to say they're about just Olympic ideals and that's it, about peace, about harmony around the world, but devoid of politics. And as you've already mentioned examples, this couldn't be further from the truth in terms of how intertwined they are with politics. From the Nazi Olympics, right, in 1936 Berlin, or even look at 1948, which is the first Olympic Games that happened after two were canceled because of the Second World War. And in 1948, basically, Japan wasn't invited, Germany wasn't invited, Italy was the only Axis power there, right? The United States used that as like a victory lap for the allies. That's political, right? And so I think that we've seen this over and over and over. We've seen this in 1968, where in the weeks leading up to the Olympic Games, Mexican government massacred students who were protesting both the games and the treatment by their government and their bodies were jumped, dumped in the Gulf of Mexico before the eyes of the world turned in to see the 68 games, right? That we know that this has been entangled. And I think that athletes have been, you know, spokespeople, whether they're on metal stands and demonstrating or people are outside the Olympic Village demonstrating. It has also been a site where people can point to this disparity, right? This, this, um, gap between the words that behold some apolitical space and the reality on the ground. And I think that's why it's been such a, you know, important space when Tommy and John, you know, formed with um, Dr. Harry Edwards, the Olympic Project for Human Rights. One of the things that they said is like, we can't roll up to the United Nations and have them listen to us. We can't go to the UN and be heard in that way. But when we're running, we have the eyes on the world, uh, eyes of the world on us, and we can speak from that vantage, from that you know platform. And I think that that is something that has continued to be true. Now, the fight often is about controlling images, and I really appreciated um, Shami how you spoke to this idea, like, oh, you can symbolically use me, right? But then I don't get the job at the end of the day. And this has been the story of Black athletes, especially from the United States, over and over and over again. Wilma Rudolph, one of the things I write about is how many times she's, you know, she has a, op, a photo op with um, President Kennedy and she is always brought in to um, be promoted. She talks about how the promoters would, wouldn't pay her, right? They just wanted to use her symbolically, but they didn't want to give her a job, right? They put her on every advisory a council you know in the world but didn't want to actually give her any modicum of power and i thought about that and this kind of way that we want to pretend that the olympics is not intertwined with what's happening and i think this was really on display in this past year in two different ways one was with covid 19 of course when you had olympic officials proclaiming that the the flame from the Olympic torch would extinguish the virus and the games would go on before they finally came to their senses and realized that they were putting athletes in harm's way. Um, but also when you see even the treatment and the experience of, of somebody like Gwen Berry, where after the killing of George Floyd, where corporations and institutions alike were suddenly digging deep to find these diversity statements and proclaiming Black Lives Matter, you know, to be, to watch some of the same institutions that had penalized Gwen um, while she was still even on probation, now say the same things that she had said, you know, not, what, 10 months before, really spoke to this gap um, between the performative and the, you know, profoundly realized. And I think that that is um, also true exactly with the Olympic Games. We know that they are wrapped up in politics. It doesn't do anybody any good to pretend that that's not the case. And then you touched upon, um, obviously, given your work as a historian, really highlighting the work of Black female athletes um, who have used their platform in such effective ways. Um, you mentioned R Wilma Rudolph. There is a side to Wilma Rudolph that a lot of people don't really know about. Um, the fact that she was very conscious, she was very active, and she was very involved. Um, so um, thank you for the work that you're doing in highlighting uh, her and other Black female athletes who don't often get 
uh, told by history uh, for their contributions. And because because of you, Dr. Davis, um, you um, I'll just speak just from my experience. Uh, you helped introduce me and I'm sure many others to the legacy of Rose Robinson. Um, who is a name that should be talked about a lot more and more. So could you explain to us who she was and her significance? Yeah, absolutely. So Rose Robinson is one of many uh, Black women athletes in history who have been perhaps overlooked. Um, Rose was a high jumper. She also ran, but she really excelled in high jump from Chicago. Um, and she you know, refused to stand for the anthem at the Pan Am Games in Chicago in 1959. Um, the other thing to really note about Rose is that this is a time where Black athletes were being used by the United States State Department to go on goodwill tours, right? And this is in the middle of the Cold War. This is completely like soft power propaganda where they're trying to tell the world like, uh, America is not so bad. Like, look what we, you know, we treat Black people great. Um, and so Black athletes were really tapped to do these goodwill tour trips. And um, when Rose was tapped to go on this trip, she refused quite publicly. Um, and she said, I refuse to be your pawn. I'm not gonna be your political pawn. I'm not gonna go on this tour to tell, to tell the world a lie, to tell the world that we're being treated okay when this is not the case. I don't wanna support your war regime. Um, and coincidentally, um, six months later, the IRS came after her for tax evasion. Um, they jailed her. She went on a hunger strike. This was over $386, so not, not a terrible amount. Um, but she refused to pay it. And she said, well, I'm not going to be forced into paying tax dollars to go towards this uh, you know, military might that's just going to hurt brown and uh, black people around the world. And so she staged a hunger strike in which she cited the fact that she was an athlete and that helped her get through it. She talked about training, the same mentality you have for doing hard things and getting over that hurdle in a training session was how she got over those initial few days of the hunger strike. And this has been something that she had been historically doing before. She, of course, helped integrate a skating rink in Cleveland where she worked with the Congress for Racial Equality. Um, they held skate-ins where they would skate around um, and try to desegregate these public accommodations, these public spaces. And she talked about how she was so good at desegregating the skating rink because she was an athlete and she would just skate away from people. Um, and they broke her arm at that skating rink. And so she has always been somebody who like explicitly is citing not only just being an athlete, but having the mentality of the athlete, which is helping her activism. Um, after being jailed for the hunger strike, she was um, finally released, completely emaciated. It really all but stopped her athletic career. Um, and so those you can kind of see some of the earlier history of this through Rose's story. But even when you mentioned Wilma, when you told that story earlier about Muhammad Ali, who at the time was Cassius Clay, um, when he returns to Louisville, Wilma Rudolph's with him, right? And so this is just one of the ways that we like, the lens of how we view history can uh, allied or erase black women right there because Wilma Rudolph was right there talking about the same kind of disparity in return and chilling in Louisville with you know, with cash at the time. And I think that that is an important way of seeing that she's experienced the same double standard as well. Um, and she's calling out it out at the same time. So Mashami, uh, what does it mean to you to, you know, learn about this history of uh, given um, your career in the Olympics and the work that you're doing as an educator and also in the process of returning to uh, obtain a spot in the Olympics? What does it mean for you to learn about this history? Well, you know, in doing the work and starting with the group, um, you know, um, above my head is actually Dr. Carlos and Tommy Smith is actually that um, picture. And um, I really dove into a lot of the history um, and I felt very proud because I know that although things were happening and starting because of George Floyd, because of Rule 50, everything that in everyone that has come before me in this Olympic movement, they are all the reasons that I was able to actually even obtain an Olympic medal and have an opportunity. And so even going into Athens at the age I was that young, I knew the people who pioneered that opportunity. And it's always been um, a matter to serve in the USA track and field space and now in the USOPC space because of that very history. You know, you can only 
I'm a firm believer that if you want to be a part of something and be great right while you're there, you leave it better than where you found it in. And even down to the smallest thing. So all I can say is that I'm just blessed to be a vessel of change um, for the change to come through. But the road and the work has long been set before myself. And I am just thankful to be the person in a position to continue to have the hard, real conversations, the honest conversations to deal with the real history, to let people know that we have to make restitution in order for there to be healing. And in order for us to really look like a Team USA delegation that's earnest to the truth of who we are as athletes and what represents those who are successful in the brand, um, it's gonna start with the healing and the healing's coming with the restitution and the recognition of those before myself that have been saying the very same things for so long and fighting for that. So I'm just honored and humbled um, every time I get on a Zoom meeting, every time I'm in a conference call, every time I share a difficult story, I just remember that there are so many more difficult stories that are five times, 10 times more difficult than what I'm going through. And I just stay strong and stay tough to continue to move on what they've said before me. So I'm just proud and stand tall in it. Absolutely. I love how you said a vessel vessel for change. And you certainly are that. Um, you certainly are that given the work that you have been doing. And that leads me to um, the other question that I brought up in the introduction, where which is how about striking a balance um, between athletic excellence with social responsibility of you know, competing effectively as an athlete on the field, on the track, on the court, et cetera, and then also maintaining a strong social conscience and investing their time and resources into that. Um, because lately there's been a lot of talk in the NBA with Kyrie Irving, right? Um, he's been criticized by people who are saying he's not investing his time on the court as he should be, where as, as we've seen uh, over the past year, um, that he has really invested a lot of his time and resources into social activism, everything from advocating for the indigenous community because he has a native identity. And then also recently it, it was told that he bought a house for George Floyd's family, um, which goes to show what kind of man he is really. And so a lot of people are really chastising him for not investing his time on the basketball court, but really the way I look at it, he's really trying to balance it all out, I think. And he's really planning, and also in addition to that, planning his life after basketball of what he wants to do. So Mashami, I wanted to ask you, how do you um, create that balance between uh, your role as an athlete and also as an activist? Well, to be truthful, you know, we're people, we're human first. We're humans before we're the athlete. and. Any athlete that starts to dial into what's most important to self, um, they're going to show up better in their sport. They're going to show up better in their relationships. They're going to show up better for the people that depend on them. And I think that oftentimes as the spectator or as the um, sponsor, you'll forget that the athlete is a human. And the interesting thing, I find it interesting when athletes start to veer into other areas and people want to say that, you know, they should be training or they should be doing this. And we forget that it's a gift. It's a gift that they were given in their spirit. So, you know, we might have to train in order to be successful, but, you know, Kyrie Irving, he can wake up and go out and do what he has to do without that same practice. And he knows what he needs to do. Um, and so it's important that we honor the human part of the athlete, because the one thing I do know is if we do not take care of our mental psychological and emotional health and you know for those who i'm a holistic athlete um that spiritual connection with self there won't be anything to watch you know you won't see and you won't be able to resonate and connect with the athlete and i think that oftentimes we forget as fans of athletes that that we're connecting with is the human spirit and you see that spirit come out on the court or in the field of play. So those athletes that are diving into that, they're going to just bring more to their game when they feel well-rounded, when they know that they are of value beyond just, like you said, the game in itself. So this is just, um, that's a, the, the name of what we're on is perfect for the reasons why athletes have to be involved in their communities and in their lives being you know, that's what gives us substantial um, substance in what it is that we're doing on the courts and on the field. And I think uh, given the circumstances surrounding COVID, where everyone is relegated to um, staying indoors, staying inside, um, has given us that opportunity to see athletes humanized, 
um, you know, in terms of their investment and their time and resources into other things that matter to them, certainly uh, in terms of, of social activism, um, which leads me uh, to what happened in the state of Georgia. Um, with the election. Um, and Dr. Davis, you pointed it out earlier. Um, what we saw in Georgia, really, um, certainly, you know, black voters were instrumental in flipping the state of Georgia um, with the help of the Atlanta Dream from the WNBA, who were very instrumental uh, in flipping the state of Georgia blue, um, given the circumstances surrounding the relationship with their co-owner, Kelly Leffler, who is no longer a senator in Georgia. Um, so, Dr. Davis, talk a little bit about uh, the strategy that the Atlanta Dream and other WNBA players engaged in uh, to help really change the course of history. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I just would start by underscoring, you know, the point that athletes are absolutely human. And this year, especially for Black athletes, um, the, ask, <laughs> the ask has been gigantic. Um, in the middle of a global pandemic and in the middle of this reckoning with, with uh, white supremacy um, and this idea of like, okay, go play, you know, in the midst of this. And so one of the other things that leads into this WNBA discussion um, is that Kyrie also helped subsidize the salaries of many WNBA players who said, hey, we're not playing. Like we're, we're Natasha Cloud said, I'm not playing. I'm going to go and keep working on social justice. And he helped subsidize the salaries. And I think that's an important point. For the WNBA players who did decide to play, they went into the wobble knowing that they were dedicating the season to say her name and specifically into Black Lives Matter generally, but specifically, especially to say her name, to shine a light on the often erased and overlooked Black women who are also, or Black women and girls who are also um, victims of police violence and police brutality um, in this country. And they dedicated the season. They, you know, literally disrupted game time use that space to highlight these stories, to help um, send money to the Breonna Taylor Foundation in particular. Um, and when they announced this back in June, Kelly Loeffler, um, who was in the midst of this Senate uh, special election, uh, used that, seized upon that to make a public proclamation of how um, this was not the way the W should be for, um, acting, they shouldn't be talking about BLM, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this is falling into a long line of politicians using Black athletes as political fodder. We've seen this playbook again and again and again. Um, and, you know, to be fair, it's a winning playbook. You know, her her approval rating um, for her white constituents shot up after she started publicly seating with her team. And for the first few weeks after that, WNBA players would, you know, tweet right back, would quote tweet her, you know, go viral, et cetera, et cetera. But they realized very quickly that this was actually benefiting her, that they were being used as political pawns. And so they got together, um, both members of the dream, like Elizabeth Williams, but also across the WNBA. Um, this is the first season they're playing under a new CBA. Their union is strong. They have a long history of activism. And they got together and they said, well, what can we do to change the narrative and instead of talking about her and responding to her and giving her more airtime, can we find a candidate that is a part of our values that we can get behind? So they vetted candidates. They did Zoom calls with politicians. They did Zoom calls with candidates. And they settled on Reverend Raphael Warnock um, as a candidate who amplified the values um, that the WNBA um, said they stood for and the athletes themselves felt confident in backing. And from that moment on, they amplified his campaign, they amplified him, they wore a Vote Warnick shirt. And this was their strategy, highly, highly strategic game plan to, to navigate this situation. The Warnock campaign itself credits a huge jump in donations um, and influx in money and support to the campaign. Um, from the week that the WNBA started to do this kind of platform for him. Um, and of course, that led to the successful uh, runoff election that pitted him directly against Sen uh, Senator Leffler, former Senator Leffler. And then you saw the mobilizing that went in all fall, right, leading up, um, you know, or all the last three months. See, I don't even know what time it is anymore in these years. Um, for the last three months leading up to this election on January 5th. And for me, I, I read the WNBA into a long organizing tradition 
you know, spearheaded by Black women. And that's what you saw in Georgia when you saw women like Latasha Brown and Stacey Abrams get out the vote, registering in the last two years over 800,000 Black voters in, in Georgia, um, in a state that has violently repressed the vote to elect a man like Reverend Warnock, who, you know, is a preacher at Ebenezer Baptist. These are, these are Black institutions that have long histories. And the WNBA and the Black women um, in that league absolutely have just added to and extended this organizing tradition and the way they use their platform um, to help this election. And by, in doing so, have laid a blueprint for perhaps the future of athletic activism. And it's also worth mentioning that the WNBA were the originators of this modern era of athlete activism going back to 2016, because let's not forget before Colin Kaepernick took a knee in August of 2016, in July of 2016, in the aftermath of the police shootings of uh, Philando Castile and Alton Sterling, as well as the killings of those five police officers in Dallas, it was Maya Moore. Uh, who, in my opinion, is the greatest of all time in every which way possible. Um, and also Tina Charles and so many other WNBA players who stood in front of the press wearing those shirts saying, change starts with us. That was a month before Colin Kaepernick. Um, and you mentioned, Dr. Davis, just what the WNBA has been able to do in terms of collective bargaining rights, in terms of paid uh, leave for their players, um, the deal that they reached uh, about a year ago was historic beyond proportions. And it really sets the blueprint, not just for what's possible in the world of sports, but in America as well, when it comes to public policy. Um, and also a shout out to Nat Natasha Cloud and Renee Montgomery and other WNBA players who took time off to really invest their time into uh, the cause. And, and certainly Maya Moore for what she was able to do and accomplish this past year with the release of Jonathan Irons and then ultimately getting married to him, which was such an amazing story uh, beyond belief. Um, so shout out to everybody for what they've been able to accomplish. And hopefully we, we will reach a point where America will finally give the WNBA credit and finally give black women credit for everything that black women have done uh, in terms of changing the course of history and, you know, always fighting for democracy when democracy has not always when democracy has not lived up um, in America all the time. So uh, with just the time that we have left, um, Mashami, I'll go to you with this, really. Um, you know, where do we go from here? I mean, that was the title of this particular show. But, you know, where do we go from here after the riots, after, um, you know, the inauguration that happened this week? You know, where do we, where do we go from here in terms of athlete activism? What would you like to see happen? You know, what I would like to see is I would like to see us as a country um, really appreciate the inclusion and the beauty of our diversity um, and to really elevate um, Black descendants of slaves because we know that the economy was built on um, Black people having been slaves here once before. And there are a lot of policies that are intertwined still in that um, for the athletes and for particularly the Black athlete for um, there to have, a, to have a rightful seat at the table um, and not just to be sitting at the table, but to be heard. Because the one thing that I do know is that we've been left out of the at, from the table so long, we've been disenfranchised and marginalized. And when you live in a free enterprise country and you leave anyone out, you are missing the beauty of the free enterprise. Inclusion um, is one of the greatest things that we can have in the United States of America to help grow and build us. And the one thing I know about Team USA, what makes us awesome, is that a lot of the things that we've been able to accomplish as a team in performance came from diversity and those that came from diverse backgrounds. So I think just continue to elevate the whole athlete um, as a person, as a human, recognize our differences, accept those, um, and also learn a space where we can always grow and change and be better. And how do we do that with one another? So I would like to see us have that conversation and really trust each other with that information to do better. Absolutely, absolutely. Couldn't agree more. And then Dr. Davis, uh, to you, um, given your expertise in, in sports history um, and being able to connect history with the present day and foreseeing a path in the future, what would you like to see happen going forward? Yeah, I would absolutely like to you know, build on, on those comments and talk about the importance of organizing, of collective action. One of the reasons why the WNBA is so effective is because there is so much collective action there. 
Um, and, and we know we are powerful uh, in numbers. The work that you all are doing in USA Track and Field, um, you know, I talked to Tiana about a lot earlier about this, even with global track athletes um, coming together and saying, hey, we are the sport. There is power there that should absolutely be tapped into and harnessed. And I think that that is lessons, as you said, Zachary, that go beyond the realm of sports, right? Like when there um, is opportunities to come together when there's opportunities to collectively organize and figuring out the ways in which those, you know, we are just so much more powerful when it is a collective action. And I think you saw that, for instance, the night of the Wildcat strike when WNBA players and NBA players and Naomi Osaka, you know, shot all of tennis down um, and it spread like wildfire because, you know, the power of the people cannot be contained in that way. Right. And so I think that that to me is the blueprint moving forward. And what I would look to and continue to see are these times in which athletes, especially following the model of the WNBA, are reaching out to grassroots activists are reaching out to scholars, are reaching out to the media, are finding these common links in order to build a sustainable movement that um, especially is linking with the movement for Black Lives and getting us all free. You know, And I think at the end of the day, that is that is the task at hand. And we have a lot of powerful people here to, to um, help bring that. Strength in numbers. It's all about strength in numbers. Um, so uh, we are just about out of time. But before we wrap up, um, just wanted to take this opportunity um, to let people know how they can support the work that both of you are doing, uh, where they can follow you and so forth. So, Dr. Davis, I'll start with you. Where can people follow you and support the work that you're doing? Oh, you know, I don't know my Twitter handle. <laughs> you guys can go to my website, AmiraRoseDavis.com. I'm on Twitter at Mira Rose 88. That sounds right. Mira mm -hmm. Rose 88. You can also check out my podcast, Burn It All Down Pod. Um, we got you covered every week with interviews with athletes and coaches and sports writers and scholars breaking down um, uh, with the intersectional lens of what's happening in the world of sport. Awesome. And Mushami? Yes, um, my Twitter and my Instagram handle is at Miss Moshami. Um, and some of the things that I'm doing, I'm getting ready to launch a nonprofit, which is why I returned to the track um, to combat teen suicide and bully prevention um, for our teens in the United States. Um, so I do have a GoFundMe page. Um, it's going to be called All Ears. And I'm just super excited to finally bring that to fruition uh, for our young people. So. Thank you so much for that, by the way. That is such an important issue. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, so Moshami Robinson, Dr. Mary Rose Davis, thank you both for joining us on Beyond the Game this evening. It was a real pleasure and an honor. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much. It was great. All righty. So um, before we go, we do want to, first of all, thank Moshami Robinson and Dr. Mary Rose Davis for joining us. And before we wrap up, we want to take this time to acknowledge the passing of one of the greatest athletic figures of all time, home run king Hank Aaron, who passed away yesterday at the age of 86. Coming out of poverty and systemic racism in the Deep South to a Hall of Fame career spanning 23 seasons from 1954 to 1976, Hank was one of the most consequential players of his generation and was one of Jackie Robinson's disciples in the post-color barrier era of Major League Baseball. He is best remembered for surpassing Babe Ruth on the all-time home run list on April 4th, 1974, and he would go on to hit 755 home runs. Along the way, he endured racist threats and vile attacks as he closed in on history. And it was during that period and in his post-baseball career where Hank became actively involved in efforts to root out racism within baseball and with society at large. Muhammad Ali once called Hank Aaron, the only man I idolized more than myself. And he was a part of a generation of athlete activists who not only demanded access, but also demanded respect for his humanity in the process. He will be missed, but never forgotten. So rest in power to Hank Aaron. That is our show. Thank you so much for joining us. Please subscribe to Nuts and Bolts Sports. My name is Zachary Draves, and on behalf of Nuts and Bolts Sports, good night, and thank you for watching.